Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the People and Processes Best Practices webinar series. My name is Tammy Pickett. Today we have Ricky Smith as our presenter. Ricky has over 30 years' experience in manufacturing, facilities, mining, and military organizations as both a practitioner and change agent in the maintenance and reliability worldwide. He worked in corporate roles as a rely global reliability engineering and maintenance engineering leader. He began his career as a maintenance technician with Exxon USA, Illuminex, Mount Holly, and Hercules Chemical, providing the foundation for his reliability and maintenance experience. Ricky is the co-author of Rules of Thumb for Maintenance and Reliability Engineers, Lean Maintenance and Industrial Repair, Best Maintenance Repair Practices, Planning and Scheduling Made Simple, Maintenance and Reliability Metrics KPIs 101, Lubrication Made Simple, and Fracas, Failure Reporting, Analysis, and Corrective Action. He's currently working on a couple of new books focused on how to optimize a PM program and root cause failure analysis made simple. He is a routine author for maintenance and reliability trade publications during the past 25 years, sharing his insight on maintenance and reliability subjects. Welcome, Ricky, and thank you for presenting for us today on best practices in storeroom and materials management. Thank you, Tammy. Warren, welcome, everyone. This will be a, uh, a short and hopefully to the point uh, presentation that you enjoy. We're going to talk today about best practices in storeroom and material management. And to most people, when they hear that, they're like, they don't understand what it means. Well, in this webinar, we're going to be focused on the metrics and measurements used to manage an effective maintenance storeroom, and then best practices for managing that storeroom, and then preventing maintenance of storeroom components. Now, some of the pictures you'll see on my slides, I actually these are actual pictures that I took from sites that I've worked with in the past, not afterwards, but before. <laughs> the uh, I want to talk to you a little bit first about what are the dollars. You know, stores dollars as a percentage of replacement asset value. If you look at the top quartile, these are the best performers. And then we got the bottom performers, you know, the bottom fourth or the middle fourth. But if we go to the top, and you notice that it's 0.3% is their stores dollars as a percentage of replacement of asset value. Now, SMRP metrics has this metric in their metrics. So it's not something that I've dreamed up or someone else. But you notice 0.3%, 0.6%. Now we go to the bottom, or look at the gap between it. You know that's why a lot of organizations that have huge storerooms, not necessarily because they need them, but because that's the way the process works overall. In other words, if, if you're reactive, you're going to have a high dollar amount in your storeroom, and, and if you're proactive, you'll have less. Now, I always tell people, you know, the maintenance store is a death trap for parts and components. And, and as a part of that, if you look at 70 to 80 percent of equipment failures are human-induced. I wonder if our parts have anything to do with it. Well, if, your part, if our parts look like that, most, most organizations don't look that bad, you know. But still, we're going to talk about some of the issues that we could have that's causing these human-induced failures. When we look at the uh, storeroom's impact on reliability, Notice I've got a block around the 68% um, of failures, which are random or infant mortality. They're really infant mortality, and then they slope out to random. In other words, they fail initially higher when you first put a part in, and then it, it levels out after a period of time. So if we store the part improperly or we buy the wrong part, the, the output of that could be equipment failure and it's a high likelihood it will be. I heard a statement one time, and I love it. It says a step in the process, if a step in the process is skipped or performed at a substandard level, it creates defects known as failures. In other words, if we don't do what we're supposed to do with our maintenance parts, we're going to have failures. There's no doubt about it. This is another picture of a store in them. So and materials management requires discipline and accountability. Just it's the same as in the maintenance function. And sometimes that's that's difficult because sometimes if the maintenance organization is reactive, then the storeroom is typically reactive. So it's hard to say I'm going to change the storeroom 
without changing the maintenance also. Because if the maintenance process doesn't go proactive, you, I, I can promise you, you won't be successful with a proactive storeroom. It'll be frustration, what it'll be. So storeroom KPIs, talking about storeroom service levels using ABC classification. Well, basically, A items or A parts is 20% of the items account for 70% of the annual consumption value of the items. B is 30% of the items and 25% of the annual consumption. And then C, 50% and 5%. Now, when we go down this bottom slide, this bo bottom quadrant, we'll see that in that A class are typically reorder points, one week supply. Delivery frequency is, is weekly. And then two is, if B is reorder points, two week supply, and delivery frequency is bi-weekly. Now, I understand when we even talk about A, B, and C parts, you know, this whole concept here, you know, this is kind of a universal thing. So every organization is going to be different in how they set up their their parts and how they set up their frequency. But the biggest thing out of this is understand that all parts are not equal. That's the point. All parts are not equal. We have to know which parts are the most critical, and we have to have them in stock. If, you're, if your organization is reactive, you're probably going to have to stock a lot of parts. If, you, if your organization is proactive, in other words, most of the work has been identified far enough in advance that something could, part can be ordered, we may not have to stock as many parts. Another one, did, you know, I learned this uh, KPI on vendor performance level from a plant manager at a site in the middle of the Everglades in Florida. And uh, basically what it is is called vendor performance levels, the right part at the right time and the right quantity. And here's an example. One time delivery, if it's 90% of the time, okay, times the right part, 97% of the time, the right quantity, 94% of the time. If you multiply those three together, it comes to 82%. Well, in this organization, they had to be 95% plus, and even that number, the plant manager was not happy with. He wanted to raise it higher, but decided not to at that time. So basically what you say, if you go to the, using this metric, is that all vendors will be measured by this metric. They need to be notified. They need to have a discussion and, and say, can you do it or not? And then establish benchmarks for vendors. And you know, and I prefer 100%, you know, but it's your choice. And then below the benchmark, vendors are put on warning six months, happens again, look for a new vendor. And if above benchmark, celebration, lunch, with award given by plant manager. And I'll tell you, when you think about a vendor, if I were to, to give an award, a plaque, to an uh, organization that sells me certain parts, and they, they can use that for marketing, it would be an incredible tool for them. So why not have them deliver us on time and celebrate it and do it once a year with the plant manager buying them lunch, have a lunch at the site, and then let them go back to where they came from. But what they do is they can sell a lot more by having you, you know, basically saying thank you for what you did for us. So just a thought. Some other best practices, kitted parts, percentage of time to write part and numbers kitted, parts returned to stores. You know, we want this zero percent of time. We don't want to have parts returned to store. That should be zero. Maintenance personnel in storeroom, zero. Maintenance personnel should not be walking around the storeroom looking for parts. If it is, that means we've got a problem. I mean, our catalog system or our part storage system is not set up correctly. These parts should be ordered as a result of work orders, on the work order, by work order number. Look on the, the maintenance software, identify the part, click, okay? And then when you come to the storeroom, this is, this is when I talk about this process, this was what I learned in 1980 when I went to work for Alumex Mount Holly, which is now Alcoa Mount Holly, that you could, you were not allowed in the storeroom. You were not, you were told that you order the part on the computer and the part will be waiting for you when you get to the storeroom if it's reactive. If it's proactive, the part has been pulled and kitted in a kitted area for you. So it's kind of interesting. So PM of critical spares, 100% PM compliance, inspection of critical components, Okay, this, this is an interesting one. 
Okay, and this is one that, that Alcoa and Mount Holly uses to this day. 100% of all motors, electric motors, that come into the storeroom are inspected by motor circuit analysis offline, looking for defects in the motors. And I asked if they've got one electrician that does this on all motors that come in. And I said, what percentage of motors are in a failed state when they come into the, to the site or brought into the storeroom? He said, well, he said, I inspect 100% of them and typically 30 to 40% have a defect in them. I said, so what do you do about it? He said, we turn around and send them back. Wow, that's pretty hardcore. But I tell you, they don't have motor failures either, premature motor failures because of it. Stockouts, 100% of items you, that are not in stock when requested. So we want to make sure that when we have stockouts, we got to measure that. We want to know how many items are we supposed to have in stock, but when we request it, they're not in stock. And then work orders, waiting parts, you know, measure based on asset criticality or defect severity by number of work orders. Remember, this is asset criticality and defect severity. So work orders waiting on parts, if there's a highly critical piece of equipment and the defect is severe, otherwise it's going to fail soon, then we probably need to have the parts on site. So just, just a thought. Then, you know, reorder point, talk about some of the best practices. Reorder point, reorder points based on the vendor's delivery time. So if a vendor says, you know, yes, we agreed to buy that part from you, they say you will deliver it in three days from the time you place an order. And that needs to be measured. It really does. Then minimum stock, or that's a safety stock. Okay, that safety stock is if I go less than this, then I'm taking a risk. So I want to certain parts because of the criticality of that part, I want to have it in stock at all times based on the severity of what happens as a result of not having the part. The maximum amount based on criticality and usage. And you notice down below I've got a chart. See maintenance spending cost, percentage of RAV, and this is maintenance spending. This isn't storeroom, 3.4%. Budget compliance, negative 0.5%. You see overtime, 2%. I go down to the next one, schedule compliance, 95%. PM compliance, 96%. Inventory accuracy is a big one, 96%. The reason I'm showing you this, this, this is actually came from Alumex Mount Holly when they were, they were certified as world class, one of three plants in the world to ever become world class. And that's where these numbers come from. But if you notice, they all correlate with each other. We can see why the inventory accuracy at 96% does impact everything else. We may say, well, there's other things. Yeah, that's, that's true. But remember what I've talked about. If a step in the process is skipped or performed at a substandard level, it creates defects known as failures. And it also results in cost, money. When we talk about the maintenance workflow, spare parts, okay? But typically our, our parts that we need come from work identification. Now this could be a reactive you know, oh my gosh, we got a breakdown. But I'm talking about proactive work. So this is from preventive maintenance or condition monitoring, predictive maintenance. And so we identify the work. It goes to planning. You notice I got a star there. That star means that now we're going to start looking at parts. These are areas that, that are critically attached to the storeroom. Maintenance scheduling. Why do I have that there? Because scheduling is not really attached to the storeroom, is it? Well, if the storeroom is supposed to kit the parts, then it can't go to scheduling until the parts are kitted in the kitting area at a certain bin or, or um, some type of storage um, laydown area. In other words, you may have an area six foot by six foot laydown for a pallet, and in that area will be certain parts. That may be like site, that could be location A1. So when those parts are laid down in that area, then it's ready to schedule. But that will affect maintenance scheduling. Work execution, definitely having the wrong part or having like one of those motors that already has a defect will impact that. Work order closeout doesn't matter. The last one's failure reporting, corrective action system, okay? So failure reporting analysis, corrective action system, if we do not do the right things in the stores and parts, how we buy them, how we store them, how we stock them, and then how we deliver them, then we're going to have a problem here. We're going to have high numbers of failures, and we're going to have somebody's going to be looking at it and saying, okay, what's the problem? 
Well, many times, now I had a conversation this morning with a, with a corporate maintenance manager. We talked about most of the failures in his organization, he said, is not a result of, you know, when they do root cause analysis, it has nothing to do with the equipment problem, it has to do with a process problem. In other words, that somebody doesn't do their PM correctly or the correct maintenance work wasn't done to specification and so on. You know, so it's continuous improvement loop is what this is. So I put this together, you know, failure mode, how equipment fails. And you notice you've got an asset, ball mill, component, motor, bearing. And the bearing is typically, it's a part that typically fails, not the, the component. Okay, the component fails as a result of the part. But the failure mode, you know, in this case it says abrasion. And then you've got causes, improper lubrication, maintenance strategies, preventive maintenance. In other words, let's get the lubrication down right. Well, one of these things that we need to do is sh the shafts on electric motors are not rotated monthly. It will cause failures. So you must rotate the shaft one and a quarter turns once a month. Now, the best storms I've seen in the world, all of them have the storm personnel that do this. And they have magnets. They put on the shaft. They put it on the motor to make sure they rotate it all the way around one and a quarter turns. Just a thought. This racy chart, this is a, something I learned a long time ago. I was at the Pentagon and somebody dropped this on my desk and said, hey, learn this. And I, I looked at it and I'm like, what is this racy thing? Well, it's a really good way of defining roles and responsibilities in any process. I didn't put a process map up here because I didn't want to confuse you, but I, I want you to understand you had a process map. Each step or function in that, in that, uh, in, in that area is going to have who's accountable, and that's the buck stops here. So it only can be one person, responsible, the doer, okay? It can be more than one, consulted in the loop. That's two-way communication. Informed, keeping the picture, one-way communication. Don't need the feedback from you. So in inventory accuracy, see who's accountable. Maintenance manager is accountable. Maintenance supervisor is informed. Maintenance planner is consulted. And then stores manager is responsible. That's to do it. Quality parts accepted. Maintenance manager is accountable. You know, stores manager is responsible. Now, what it does is it, it keeps people all aligned. It keeps all of our people aligned in a proactive manner to know what are we supposed to do and when. Store and preventive maintenance, okay, because there are things we need to do in storing, like rotating the shafts. It may, it, it's going to be, the, to me, in my opinion, it's going to be the store and personnel that's going to rotate those shafts, not a maintenance person, okay? So the maintenance manager is still accountable. Stores manager is the responsible individual. Now, the maintenance supervisor is also responsible because there may be some large motors that have to be, preventive maintenance has to be performed on them, and I'd rather have a maintenance technician do it than a, than a store in person. So some stores PMs. We talked about the motor circuit analysis offline, the rotation of large bearings, rotation of, of gearbox box shafts, oil and grease storage PM inspection. I think this ought to be a monthly PM until you get into a state that you can now say where my oil and grease is stored is to specification. And if you want to know what specification is, just, just give me a call after this presentation or sometime in the next few weeks, and I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Spare parts inspection by maintenance technician. Parts rotation, first in, last out. Okay. So, so when parts come in, we, want, we don't want the first part to come in to be the first one out. We want it to be the last one out. Otherwise, only your new parts are going out. Your old ones are sitting in the back. Sooner or later, we're going to need them, and they're not going to function properly. Some of the inspections by maintenance technician, open bearings. Like I say, this should be this should also be a monthly inspection. Open bearings, in other words, someone's open a bearing. I don't know if no one's ever seen this in the storeroom, because they're looking for the right bearing. Now that, that that boggles me. It means we've got something wrong with our system and process somewhere. So we look for that. We do a V uh, belt inspection, make sure we don't they're stored properly the way they're supposed to be, curled up, rolled up, and they don't have cracks on them and so on. Conveyor belt inspection. I know this may surprise you, but I was at I was at a site, and this was at a in the desert in Texas, whatever you want to call it. I call it the desert, hot, dry. They had conveyor belts stacked up on the floor in the storeroom, 
and the storeroom or the procurement agent was bragging about how these conveyor belts, he saved so much money by purchasing in bulk. And I'll tell you, every one of those conveyor belts he purchased, it's got cracks in it because it was in stored in the wrong environment. And you can see what I'm talking about. I mean, everybody's seen these kinds of things. Now, question is, do you want to stop failures at the stores, at the source? And if you want to stop failures at the source, then we need to change the way we're dealing with the storeroom. So a storeroom is a terrible place for failures to begin. So conclusion. Make people part of changes to storeroom and purchasing. In other words, you've got to engage people. You can't say, we're going to do this. It's best to engage people. And I, I believe that next part, educate everyone. And it's not just educate everyone on new policies and procedures, but to understand what best practices in stores and purchasing are. Implement those best practices in stores. Now, we've already you know, made people part of the changes. We've educated everyone. Now we implement best practices in the storeroom, and now we develop a, a, met, a stores metric scorecard and post for everyone to see. I want, to, I want this metric scorecard that when somebody walks in a storeroom, that's the first thing they see. How well are we doing? Because it's all of us together. It's not a storeroom thing. It's a site-wide thing. This is my recommendation. Keep the storeroom locked and controlled. It can be costly when a part is not there when you need it. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I went to one site of the power plant, and the uh, maintenance manager said, "I got to show you this video. I got this is from the camera in our storeroom." And you look on the video, and it, it was taken one night. And these two guys come in, and they got they got masks on, and they're they're like looking around, searching around the storeroom, looking for something. It's like they were thieves that broke in, and. Uh, it was kind of funny because they just started locking the storeroom, so they were just making a joke out of the situation. But uh, to be honest with you, there's no joke here. We, we need to have that storeroom locked and controlled. Now, before I open up for questions, just uh, wanted to let you know, if you would like to join me June 2nd through 4th in Houston, Texas, I'll be teaching a three-day class on storeroom and materials management, and I'd love to see you there. So at this time, i open this for questions. Actually, Ricky, we're going to do a couple polls first. Oh, okay. So. Can I vote? You can't vote. Okay. Our first poll question is, who does your storeroom personnel report to? Purchasing, operations, maintenance, or you don't know? I'll give a few minutes. Let's see if everybody's voted. All right. I'm going to close the poll. And looks like 63% report to maintenance, 13% to operations, and 25% to purchasing, Ricky. Okay, it's interesting. You know, the best way to control it, uh, I know, I know, production. If you look at overall, you know, the volume of, of inventory, they do have a lot of inventory. But most of the stuff, the items in a storeroom, have to do with maintenance and reliability. That's why I want the maintenance and reliability manager to manage that. That's just my opinion. Okay, go ahead. All right, let's see our second poll question. Is your storeroom locked and monitored? Is it locked and staffed 24-7, locked and staffed daily only, open with no staffing, or you don't know? I'll wait just a couple more minutes. Yeah, many organizations use the badge. They're their uh, badge at work, that they can tell them when they log in, when they come to work, but also when they go in the store, when they went in, how long they've been in, and so on. And I, I had to do that one time with a PLC. I set up a PLC at the, at the door of the store room. That would unlock the door, but you had to use a certain code, and that code told me who was in the store room and how long they were in the store room. 
All right, Ricky, our results are in, and it looks like 13% say that their storeroom is locked and staffed 24-7. 67% says locked and staffed daily only, and 20% has open with no staffing. Well, the only one that really is a concern is the ones that's open. I mean, they this came about in the uh, 90s when it was like, you know, we're going to have open storerooms, and so many companies lost so much in parts at the value. But also, it, it's so much not so much the money value to me as it is not having a part when I need it. So how are you going to go into, into your material management system on a computer and, and determine if a part's in stock? For sure, you don't. So just a thought, okay? Tammy? Okay, here's our third poll question. How would you rank your storeroom? Excellent, good, average, or needs improvement? Give just a couple more seconds and we'll close the poll. Looks like 7% said excellent, 13% good, 13% average, and 67% needs improvement, Ricky. Well, you know, the first part of change, you know, and improvement is knowing you got a problem. So it sounds like quite a few of you know you got a problem. So that's that's the good thing. Now, the hardest part is now doing something about it. So Wish you luck and hope you, you do well in your endeavor because we got to do something with storm. We have to. And I'll tell you, with this class I got coming up, it, it isn't so much maybe to educate someone like yourself, but if someone higher up, the one that controls the storeroom, the way it's managed, maybe you want to bring them to the class. But just a thought. Okay, go ahead, Tammy. Okay, and we'll bring up our fourth poll question. How many KPIs are you using for your storeroom? One, two, three or more, or don't know? Yeah, I like to have those metrics posted right there at the door when people come in. All right, let's close this poll. Looks like 50% are using one, 19% three or more, or 31% don't know. Okay, a lot of room for opportunity. That's good. Well, I want to thank everyone for the uh, sitting in with this presentation today, and hopefully you got something out of it of value. Hopefully you go back and you make some changes. If you need some help, you can just send me an email. I'll be glad to talk to you, R. Smith at peopleandprocesses.com, or you talk to Tammy. You know, she's probably the easiest one to get a hold of because a lot of times I'm uh, either out of the country or somewhere else, who knows. So anyway, thank you very much for your time, Tammy. Actually, we've got a couple questions, Ricky, if you can answer for them. Okay. Um, the first one is, should planners be allowed to come and just get parts out of my storeroom? To get parts, to be... But I guess the question can be seen both ways. One is the planner just walks in and picks up a part, or the planner can go check in, check out a part in the storeroom. Um, I see nothing wrong with a, with a planner going in the storeroom and checking the part out themselves. I personally like if I'm going to kit the parts. Now, understand, planner does not deal with reactive maintenance. So if you, if you need a part right now and you call a planner, the next thing you should hear is a dial tone. Okay? So if they hear the dial tone, you, you call the wrong person. So a planner can go into the storm, in my opinion, and, but they have to follow the process. But again, parts should be kitted by the storeroom and not by the planner. Planners should be doing their job, and that's planning work. Okay? Okay, and then the second question is, should the maintenance planners go through storeroom training? Um, I think that would be a great idea. You know, and... And I tell you, if you got a problem, you know, you think with the storeroom too, you may want to bring uh, the maintenance manager with you as well. You know, it's, it's up to you guys. But uh, you think about who you need to go to training like this, because it's not just about training storeroom people. It's also all about educating management too. Good okay. questions. There's a third question. 
how many KPIs should we be using in our storeroom? Wow, that's a good question. Um, typically, a leading KPI, which leads to the results, which is your lagging KPI, you could you'll you'll probably have you can have anywhere from ten to fifteen. Okay, there's a lot of KPIs that need to be used in a storeroom. Okay, because there's a lot of things they need to be watching for, not not finding a problem. Oh my gosh, should we should be able to see a problem coming with the metrics? Lagging metric, which is the results, I'd I'd say no more than six. Uh, prefer four to six metrics at the max. Okay, and I like to have them posted in the storeroom door so everybody can see them. Okay, I hope I answered everybody's questions. What they wanted, they not like what I heard, but hopefully you uh, you appreciated what I had to say. Okay. Well, we appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with us, Ricky. And at the end of this webinar, you're going to receive a survey that asks you if there are other topics that you'd like to hear from one of our practitioners. So please fill that out. And if we can be of any assistance, please contact Ricky or I. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. Goodbye.